Good evening, everybody. They, they put my face up there, so I know it's my turn to get up here. <laughs> it's kind of cue time for me. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, our evening's talk. On behalf of the Center for International Governance Innovation and the Bolsili School of International Affairs, welcome to the beautiful CG campus. Uh, before we begin the, our land acknowledgement, uh, CG acknowledges that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. CG is situated on the Haldimand Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. Uh, I will introduce our uh, host and our speaker, and then a little bit about the presentation today. Our uh, host is Jenna Hennebury. Uh, Jenna holds a PhD in sociology from Western University. She has more than 15 years of interdisciplinary research experience uh, dealing with issues of migration, dealing with her, uh, beginning with her former employment with the Canadian federal government to her current position as associate director uh, at Wilfrid Laurier University's department, uh, associate professor at Wilfrid Laurier University's Department of Communication Studies and the Bolsili School of International Affairs. She's the co-founder and past director of the IMRC, the International Migration Research Center, where she's now senior research associate. She's carried out numerous high profile research projects on labor migration governance and migrant worker rights, focusing on social protection, health, migration industries, and gender. Uh, our speaker, Alison, Alison Pitlock, is the program manager for Reaching Critical Will, which is the disarmament arm of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She contributes to the organization's monitoring and analysis. Oh, and her parents, her mum's here, and the family are over here. I can't see with the lights on, but I'm waving. Um, so she's got a friendly audience she can talk to as well. Uh, she contributes to the organization's monitoring and analysis of disarmament processes, as well as its research and other publications, and liaises with UN government and civil society colleagues. Prior to this role, Alison worked in policy and advocacy with the, coalition, with the Control Arms Coalition, focusing on the Arms Trade Treaty. She's also worked with Religions for Peace and Minds Action Canada on a broad range of arms issues and has significant experience in campaigning. Um, and advocacy in research and writing, project management, and multilateral treaty negotiations. She has a BA in international relations from the University of Toronto, despite which we're welcoming her here, um, and an MA also in international relations from City University of New York. She's an expert with the Forum on the Arms Trade and a 2018 UN Women Metro New York Champion of Change. Uh, as you will know, tomorrow is International Women's Day, uh, so this event is sort of getting a, a little bit of a head start on, on that. Um, disarmament and arms control, security and related fields have been and continue to be traditionally male-dominated fields. Organizations such as the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom work to challenge these norms and to address issues of gender, militarism, peace and security by empowering citizen-led initiatives to enact changes within political frameworks. As part of CG's and the Bolsili School's uh, uh, celebration around International Women's Day, we invite you to join us for an evening with Alison Pitlock, manager for Reaching Critical Will. Alison will explore contri the contributions of women to peace building, disarmament, and arms control, and also talk about the gendered impacts of conflict in the world today. So Alison, uh, welcome to CG. Thank you. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. This is a rather intimidatingly large auditorium. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start, of course, by saying thank you to CG for inviting me to be here tonight to speak at this event, um, but also for having this event and drawing more attention and profile to International Women's Day and also to issues of feminism more broadly. Um, before I begin, I want to just say two quick things. Um, first is to acknowledge that we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight. Um, it's not 
most of it definitely is not the product of my own research and my own writing. Um, a lot of it is taken from the writing and research and lived experiences of other women, some of whom I'm privileged to know and to work with. And so I think that in the spirit of feminism, it's important to share that and to acknowledge that and to not take credit. Um, and secondly, as has already been pointed out, I do have a very large uh, family contingent in the audience tonight, possibly the largest I've had in an audience since my high school dance recitals. Um, <laughs> but the reason I want to point that out is because among them are many women who have shown me through their own choices and their own courage what it is to be strong, independent, and to support one another as women. So thank you to everyone in my family. All right, let's get started. I like to start these talks with a little bit of audience participation. Um, the words, women, weapons, and war. What does that mean to you, especially when you take those three words together? And I would really invite uh, anybody in the audience who feels they have an opinion on that or a reaction to it, just to shout it out, I know it's a little bit intimidating sometimes, but be brave and just throw out a few things that you might be thinking. Dissonance, Dissonance yep. Victims. Victims. Definitely more masculine. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the reason I like to do this is because I, I feel sometimes in some places people would immediately say that they don't necessarily see a connection between them. Um, and others might have very strong feelings about this, so it's helpful to get a sense of where we're starting from. My presentation tonight is going to cover a lot of ground. Um, we're going to start by going through some key concepts and terminology that relate these topics to one another. Then I'll try to explain what role do the concepts of gender, along with biological sex, play in relation to experiences of conflict and armed violence? And what does it mean to have a gendered approach to disarmament, arms control, and peace building? Why is it important? And then later on through the discussion and through a video that I'll introduce later, we're going to look at some of the solutions and responses to this and the necessity of women having an active role in peace building processes. So let's go through a few key terms here. Um, gender and sex are often conflated, and especially I spend a lot of time working in the United Nations with uh, a lot of different diplomats and different NGOs, and I feel like right now there's a lot of interest and attention on this issue, but there isn't always clarity around some of the basic concepts that are being discussed. So it's helpful to sort of set that out now at the beginning of this talk, when we're talking about sex, we are referring to the biological and physiological characteristics that define men and women. Gender refers to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for men and for women. My presentation will encompass both. Being aware of gendered roles in society has a direct influence on how men and women differently experience conflict and war. And I like this little infographic because I feel like it sums it up well. <laughs> All right, feminism. You know, trying to lock down a single definition of feminism, especially in 2019, is not easy. Um, there are lots of different historic views on what feminism is, what it looks like in practice. Um, certainly, I think in this era of Me Too and women's marches, it's taken on a new energy. Um, it's also very different if you're talking about international relations versus corporate spaces. Um, but I would say that all are very rooted in a central belief in the full equality of women. Some feminism, and certainly the feminism of the organization that I work for, go further than that. And it's also a worldview as well, in which the starting point or understandings Sorry, the starting point in understandings are the lives and the perspectives of women, which makes them visible, and it subverts gendered relations of power in society. So it's very much a one that's rooted in power dynamics between women and between men. Feminists argue that gender relations of power are implicated in the social construction of violence and war, which I'll parse out a bit more later in my presentation. Patriarchy. 
uh, is, as I'm sure you would guess, the opposite of that, uh, can be defined as a system of social organization that institutionalizes the male power over women and puts male interests and values at the center of our social life. It is a gendered process of dominance by men and subservience of women. Gender-based violence, and this will become important as we start to talk about the weapons, the conflict, and the violence aspect um, of the topic tonight. Gender-based violence can be defined as violence that is directed at a person based on discriminatory norms and practices relating to her or his specific sex or gender role in society. This is the most prevalent form of violence in the world. It is most commonly committed against women and girls, and it too is rooted in unequal power relationships. There are generally four types of recognized gender-based violence, uh, sexual, physical, emotional, and psychological, and socioeconomic. And I, I find, especially when you're talking about weapons, war, conflict, and violence, it's so easy to think only about the, the physical impacts, sexual gender-based violence, and not that that is any less important, but it is also important to sort of lift up the socioeconomic aspects of this as well. Oh yes, this is my little animation. Um, okay, so given all of these sort of textbooky sounding definitions, um, what does this have to do with weapons, violence, and war? And I often find that it's helpful to try to break this down into three categories or three approaches of trying to understand that. The first would be the visible and the direct effects. And this is how you see actual weapons being used against people because of their sex or gender in either a conflict situation or a situation of armed violence. And unfortunately, the world is all too full of examples of the systematic rape of women in conflict situations conducted by armed men. Countries with high rates of female homicides cite that firearms are used in more, three, more than three quarters of those cases. Um, there's sort of, an, and compiling my research for this presentation tonight, I came up with a very long list of instances and, and cases, some of which are better known than others, just to cite a few. Um, examples of lawful arms holders committing sexual abuse include act by armed Sudanese government forces against expatriate and displaced women. Um, security forces in Sri Lanka and Mexico committing gender-based violence against women in detention centers to procure confessions by police against Kenyan women during the 2007 and 2008 post-election violence, and by private security guards in a wide range of national contexts. It should also be noted that in societies that are heavily militarized, and by this I mean that there's a heavy day-to-day -day presence of, of either private security guards, police, or militaries, research shows that there is a heavy correlation in countries and societies like that with a sense of impunity towards GBV. It creates an overall permissiveness around the problem. The second direct effect that I wanted to mention, and this is sort of best exemplified by the ionizing radiation uh, graphic up there, it's a bit different. It's sort of about how our bodies react differently to different types of weapons. Um, nuclear weapons have a different impact based on your sex. Radiation affects male and female bodies very differently. Uh, there are many horrific examples from the legacy of nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific region where you hear stories of deformed babies, women becoming sick themselves because the land and water sources were contaminated and that was through nuclear weapons testing. And the third visible and direct effect I wanted to mention, a little bit different, um, I don't know how much you're following sort of the rise of drone warfare and drone surveillance, um, but here actually it's males that are being targeted mostly in drone strikes, because the way in which it works, um, there are different signifiers which create a profile, and that's what the drone operators are looking for when they make a strike. And maleness, and being male of a certain age in a certain place and time, is one of those signifiers. So there you see sort of a targeting of men because of their maleness um, in a very direct and visible way. The second category 
um, that I would say there are, are the indirect and invisible effects. And these are obviously, by, by their name, a lot less tangible, a lot less easy to put a face on. Um, so th I like to think about it this way. Social constructs in most places mean that most combatants are male. Whether that means that you're fighting in a gang, you're joining the military, you become a police officer, most people who are wielding weapons in a situation of conflict or violence are men. And men are therefore statistically more likely to be killed or seriously injured in fighting. Women may survive those experiences, but their life experiences are going to be altered and impacted by the loss of their husband, father, brother, partner, in many different ways. But that, that change in their lifestyle, it's harder to quantify, it's harder to understand, and that's why this is called an indirect or an invisible effect. So for example, when this often happens, maybe the woman in the family then has to take on um, new responsibilities and new roles to earn income and become a caregiver or become a provider. But sometimes, in some places, it's not always easy for women to do this because of barriers to education or social stigma around being a woman who works or balancing that with childcare and other responsibilities that are deemed more traditionally female. As well, in some cultures, particularly in agricultural areas and developing countries, the roles that are assigned to women put them at greater risk of certain types of weapons exposure. For example, the activities of food and water collection. And this is also an example of an indirect effect. Um, recently, in South Sudan, with severe food insecurity and economic crisis across the country, women and girls also have to walk further to forage for food, firewood, and other necessities to survive, which has exposed them to greater risk of rape, abduction for the purposes of sexual slavery, and other forms of GBV. And this is not to say that the experience of one or the other is better or worse, because in war, everyone loses, but rather that they are different experiences that need to be understood on their own terms to develop policy responses that address the needs of everyone equally and fairly. There we go. <laughs> um, and then thirdly is I want to talk about the conceptual and the structural linkages between weapons, conflict, gender, and sex. So take a big step back and think about the nature of war, of fighting, of aggression. Think about the military ethos of protecting one's loved ones or one's country in which you, as a warrior, are strong. These are deeply patriarchal perspectives that celebrate a view in which strength is demonstrated by violent behavior. Both of those are encouraged and often celebrated, whereas any efforts toward peace and dialogue are often deemed as weak or not good enough, not strong enough. And this perspective is at the foundation of our international political system, but also in our homes and in our communities. I have two examples to make that point, if my slides will cooperate. <laughs> um, the, first, the first example comes from Kenya. So in my former job, I worked with the Control Arms Coalition, where we were closely involved in the negotiations of the Arms Trade Treaty. Um, and somewhere in the course of the campaigning and the negotiations, um, a young man named Julius Arile from Kenya got really involved in our campaign effort. Um, Julius is from a part of Kenya where people are pastoralist, meaning that they are nomadic, and that they also raise livestock, mostly cattle. And feuding between different nomadic groups moving in that area uh, has been common for centuries, and so too is stealing each other's cattle. It's called cattle rustling, and it's been a part of their practice lifestyle for centuries. With the introduction of guns and more sophisticated weapons, the level and scale of violence in the course of a cattle rustling raid or operation has increased quite a lot. Julius, um, Julius was a cattle rustler. He grew up being told that he needs to take up the gun. He needs to take up the gun so he can be strong. He can protect his people, his family, that he can go to other communities and take their cattle and that will become food for his family. And it was a very strong um, narrative from him explaining how from a very young age, this idea of having a gun would bring him strength and also protection for those around him. Julius lost his best friend, 
uh, he was shot in the course of a cattle rustling raid. And at that point, Julius decided that he wanted to instead become a peace activist, which is how he found his way to the Control Arms Coalition. Incidentally, Julius was also a very good runner who one day placed fourth in the New York City Marathon and has since lost this, launched this entire other career. Um, so Gun Runners is a film about his story. I would definitely recommend it. It was produced by the Canadian Film Board and I think it really shows both what I was speaking to earlier about the importance of guns and the symbolism and imagery around that, um, but also how someone's life can change and they can take a different course. My second example um, comes from the United States, which is a very different place uh, than Kenya. It also has its own issues with gun use and violence that I don't understand. Um, but anyway, so in the, in the course of researching and preparing for this presentation, I came across this interesting blog by a man who had gone around to different social media platforms and he had written on them pro-gun sense or anti-gun, um, and just like, like things like on Facebook pages and, and Reddits and like Twitter groups and things like, not Twitter groups, Twitter and things like this. And then he compiled all of the responses um, that came back to what he had to say. Um, and you can read up there, um, they all have this very, very strong narrative of challenging his masculinity and his manliness because he was anti-gun. This one says, look at that, a pillow biting chicken queen who sidelines is an attention whore obsessed with his lack of masculinity and still trying to work out his rage because mommy and daddy didn't accept him. Sees guns as a symbol of the masculinity he could never achieve, so he hates them and the people connected with them. So the reason <laughs> why I've been uh, pointing out these different uh, differentiated kinds of effects and experiences and world perspectives is because I think this really demonstrates why we need to approach issues of disarmament, peace building, and arms control with a gender analysis and a gender perspective. Gender analysis is a tool to better understand the different social, economic, cultural, and political realities of women and men, girls and boys. And at its core is an understanding culture is understanding culture, underlying the underlying values, norms, and beliefs expressed in the construction of gender identities and inequalities. And the reason why, if you approach these issues and these problems with this in mind, is you're going to develop better solutions. You're gonna develop solutions that actually address the needs of everybody. So mine action, landmine action, uh, is a really good example of this. Uh, there's a very well-documented history of how landmine exposure is different for women than it is for men, how the experiences of somebody after they've lost a limb or they've lost their sight, how that journey is different based on your sex and or your gender. Um, so I take an example here from land release programs in Lebanon. Uh, in many places of the world, uh, it's very difficult for women to own land. It's always in the man's name. Um, recently, different mine action groups have been trying to work together with government authorities. So after they finish clearing an area of land from, le from mines and they return it back to the family or back to the community, um, everyone is involved in that process. It's not directed just towards the men in the family, but it's trying to give a sense of equality and ownership of all in that piece of property. Another good example of where we see this a lot are in disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs, which is kind of a mouthful, so we can say DDR. Um, DDR is the process that ex-combatants go through in, in literally disarming them, demobilizing them, but more importantly is also the reintegration into society. And if you've been a fighter, and whether this is in a national military or in an armed group somewhere, your reintegration back into civilian life and the day to day, it's difficult and it's challenging. And it's also gonna be different if you're a man returning from war or if you're a former female fighter and you're returning from war. And so developing DDR programs that are tailored to people based on their gender or their sex is important in making that experience better and more effective and longer lasting. Um, and then finally, 
peace agreements and peace building. As I think you've probably surmised by now, I believe strongly and hope that most of you do too, that women are equal stakeholders in all the things that affect us. And that includes going from conflict into a situation of peace. But peace processes, the negotiations, they've always been very heavily male dominated and women are kind of sidelined from that process. But by bringing a gender analysis and a gender perspective to the negotiation of the agreements and thinking through the longer term implications for all citizens, because we're all stakeholders with rights, you end up with a much better result that lasts longer. Research shows that the participation of civil society groups, including women's civil society groups, makes a peace agreement 64% less likely to fail. And when women participate in peace processes, the resulting agreements are 35% more likely to last for at least 15 years. This slide is taken from a campaign that my organization is launching next week with a Nobel Women's Initiative based in Ottawa and a Korean women's group called Women Cross D DMZ to advocate for a Korean peace, peace treaty by 2020 that has women at the table at every step of the way. So on that note, I'm gonna transition now to a video um, that my organization has produced. Um, I think you'll find it interesting and includes perspectives from many of the women in our wider global network on the role of women in peace building and peace processes, but they're all coming from different places, different national contexts, um, and I think it's really important to hear from them in their words why this is important. So I think we'll, we'll change over now. When the agreements were beginning and the negotiations started, the first picture that was out in the newspapers was a big picture and it said, the men of the peace. We were so furious. Women have been working so hard for peace for so many years and never heard We've been excluded. We're not being consulted or called for participation. And then I was thinking, I don't think this peace process or this reconciliation will go or will work because it lacks gender perspective. This international community completely understanding how you deal with war through dealing with men with arms, completely not thinking of experiences on the ground, on, of experiences of women peace builders. For me, la paix c'est pas seulement qu'il n'y a pas de balles qui crépitent. La paix pour moi, c'est me sentir bien. Je peux quitter ma maison à n'importe quelle heure sans craindre que je vais être violée sur la route, sans craindre que je vais être attaquée par un, un groupe armé. Les femmes ont raison de travailler sur la paix. And it's all the people who have to come with women to work for peace. We all live in a society shaped enormously by gender. I had real work to do both on myself, um, to kind of reflect on the cost of masculinities in my own life, um, and to address this massive problem of men's violence against women. Violence against women have been there everywhere. So that's why women talk about peace in another way. It's not a biologically being a woman, so hence we magically solve everything, but it's the, ex the specific experiences we have as opposed to men with guns. We are the women that are on the ground. We know what is happening to us. We know what we want. We are supposed to be actors. We are not just supposed to sit there and watch. If the peace talks were just discussing how to stop the killing, then the natural conclusion is yes, you should be talking to the men with guns. But the peace talks in Bosnia, they literally pinned down our constitution. We are stuck with that constitution 25 years later. So if we are discussing a whole vision of a country, for sure you cannot exclude 50% of the population. We, as women, are capable of building peace. We want to 
we try to bring the voices of women, not as victims, but as voices of women in our society. At the international level, we have to be present. We have a different voice to raise. We're doing the activism work. We're meeting families. We're doing the humanitarian aid. We do uh, women's rights projects. So uh, we the one have louder uh, voices in, within uh, these communities. I think uh, we within WILP's initiative in Bosnia have extensively explored the consequences on the lives of women, but also when on the society. women are included, it's basically uh, on a very kind of nominal level. We count the number of women that are representative in politics, but we don't really address the patriarchal structures. So, okay, you can provide support to victims of sexual violence or civilian victims of war, but if we discuss constitutional changes and you want your piece of the cake, then that's really outside of your domain. So far, the participation of women at the political level is very limited at the United Nations institutions. And our spaces are not those wide and we are not given all the chances. Actually, we are you know, speaking about structured discrimination. We want a strong and robust international accountability architecture. In as much as the structure remains intact, um, getting women's voices into those structures um, won't have the impact that it should have. Our hope is that strong women's voices within this institution begin to shift priorities. We have to think more broadly about fundamental reform to the UN system. There's need for the UN to, be, to play an interactive role with the people. But as it is now, it's like the UN is there to set the agendas for the grassroots. We should look at the roots instead of starting at the top. Quand les membres du Conseil de sécurité arrivent dans les villages, ils sont tellement pressés. Ils n'ont même pas le temps de parler aux gens. Ils ne mettent pas dans leur agenda la rencontre avec les femmes. Non, ils rencontrent les autorités. Les Nations Unies doivent changer sa façon de communiquer avec nous. If you actually consider women as experts, if you consider women as knowledge providers, uh, as negotiators, as signatures to these peace agreements, if you consider women's priority as uh, the main and the center uh, of the peace agreement agenda, this is a meaningful participation. en vivant dans un pays en guerre pendant 20 ans. Je sais ce que c'est. Et j'ai vu des hommes trembler. Les gens qui pensent que la, ce sont les, les, les femmes qui veulent seulement la paix, les hommes ne veulent pas la paix. Je ne pense pas. Parce que c'est tout le monde qui veut la paix pour que nous puissions vivre et, et faire le développement. We need uh, the solidarity, we need the support. And I, I love the word solidarity. I love it so much. It's getting men to recognize um, their roles, our roles, and responsibilities with regards to advancing gender equality and women's rights. It's only when both men and women start to fight for that, that we, all democratic elements within society try to fight for that. We have a lot of experiences where we failed because we were alone. I don't have one dream that is just specific for me, but there are people dreaming the same or similar dreams. Quand il y a la paix, c'est tout le monde qui gagne. Mais quand il y a la guerre, c'est tout le monde qui perd. We want to be involved in uh, peace negotiations. We want to be involved in conflict resolution. To take the, uh, the lead and uh, uh, contribute to the aspired change for a better world, a changing world where we see equality between gender equality, equality between men and women, uh, where women can enjoy their rights. If we want to be in politics, we want to make politics. We want to make change. 
a different rules of the game. powerful video, pretty impressive, and pretty amazing work that you've done uh, with this organization. Thank you for sharing some of it with us uh, here today. Um, so our plan now is uh, basically um, I get the benefit of av having a, at least one of the first questions, uh, and we can have a, a discussion uh, with, with Alison about, uh, about her work, about the organization's work, about the issues, and then we'll, uh, we'll call up, and you're also invited to be able to be part of this conversation in a few minutes uh, as well. So first I wanted to just uh, start by uh, picking up on something from the video and something that, uh, that you talked about as well. Uh, one of the things that I think is often prevalent when we think about um, you know, women, weapons, war, is this perception that women, if anything, the only role they play is as victims, right? Um, and um, what we know instead is that in the cases of conflict, in the cases when there has been um, uh, situations of violence, women are often actually the first responders in crisis. Um, they're often those who are staying to rebuild uh, shattered communities. But we also know uh, that there's um, some challenges in terms of getting their voices uh, into policy fora, international fora. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also know things like in, the, in terms of the UN budget uh, around uh, the interagency budget targeted towards women and, and girls was just 0.4% you know, um, uh, in, in, in one period in 2014. Um, I want to know whether that's changed, and I want to know what structurally is happening to be able to enable um, those voices to be heard, uh, mm -hmm. to better support women as they engage in rebuilding their communities post-conflict. Okay. Well, first, I want to make sure this is working. It sounds like yeah, it's working. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, no, I'm really glad that you brought that up, because what I had wanted to say prior to showing the video um, is that I like it because it's, it's of course, women have been victimized, you, you, it's an undeniable fact, um, but women are also contributing and we're stakeholders and we have a role to play and there's this whole positive side of that that often gets overlooked um, and I don't want to diminish the, under the importance of understanding what women go through on the other side of that as victims, but to also recognize that we have agency and we have a role to play. Um, Yes, there are barriers, I think, at every level, from the community right on up through to the UN Security Council. And I think it's a reflection of how our societies were developed. I think it's, and that then, by extension, is how our international political system, how states interact with each other, how our intergovernmental institutions were designed. Um, and they, they really reflect that. Recently, in the disarmament space and arms control space, particularly at the UN multilateral level, there's been this sort of explosion of interest in, in gender issues, um, which I feel like most diplomats I speak with, I don't even know if they know what they, that means always. <laughs> like, I think it's become sort of a catchy, catch-all term uh, for a lot of the different, more nuanced things that I was trying to speak to earlier. Um, and it's been, it's been really positive in lots of ways because we're gaining attention to the issue, we're gaining ground. Uh, but I do definitely feel like there is still a very, very strong disconnect between the, the resolutions being passed in the UN um, where everything is about you know, getting precise terminology and precise language into something. But you, you meet someone who doesn't do anything in that space and they have no idea what this is. They don't know that there's a resolution out there that's designed to help them because I think as it was said in the video, it's a sort of top-down approach. Exactly. Um, in a related question, um, another sort of really common um, uh, um, 
uh, concept that's floating around in the UN right now and one that we here at home in Canada have heard a fair amount is this idea of feminist foreign policy. I, I would like to know from your perspective if you think that feminist foreign policy can actually help to mitigate some of the, the threats to human security uh, for women in these contexts, mm -hmm. um, whether it is the solution for being able to enable a more gender-based approach to, um, to addressing issues of, of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so for those who don't know, feminist foreign policy um, I think it was Sweden that sort of started this ball rolling in the international system in 2015 under the former government and f the former foreign minister, Margot Wallström, she was really the one who pioneered this. Um, Canada subsequently in 2017 announced a feminist assistance uh, policy, which is slightly different. Um, and it's, but it sort of also has implications for foreign policy in the security space as well. So I have a couple of thoughts on that. I think it's really great because it raises the profile of the need for feminist approaches, or at the very least, gendered approaches to these different issues, to these different problems. Um, it gets a lot of media, it gets a lot of profile. Um, what I've seen before, uh, or what I've seen so far rather, is that I don't know that the policies themselves are quite yet sharpened. I think there's a lot of good rhetoric um, about this intention to have a feminist foreign policy or feminist approach, but I've spoken with government officials and th they, they don't know. They're like, what, what do we do? How, what do we change? How do we make our government feminist now? Um, and that's not gonna happen overnight. I think the intentions are there, but it's still sort of a work in progress. And then it's also a bit of a weird, um, I guess, conundrum because you know, a lot of foreign policy is also about reinforcing the existing world order. And so traditionally, more gender sensitive policy and programming has been focused on domestic issues, uh, maybe gender equality in the workforce, equal pay for men and women in the workforce, uh, reducing violence against women in domestic contexts. Um, but in the international space, it's, it's quite new. And there's also a lot of tensions between other aspects of government practice. So for example, Canadian arms transfers to Saudi Arabia of light armored vehicles is a very direct contradiction to what it's purporting um, to, be a, to be a feminist foreign policy because you can't really have both coexisting together. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too because the, the dynamic around thinking about feminist foreign policy um, and responding to conflict on the one hand, but then the realities around the fact that so many that are displaced are women uh, and we have no sort of gender-based approach to managing uh, displacement and uh, to responding to the kinds of uh, creation of, of situations that happen mm -hmm. in, in the context of conflict. So, so, so then what then? So if we're thinking about the UN system, we're thinking about governments, what are the other actors at play here? And um, I know that there are so, so many women engaged uh, in, in uh, local level initiatives. They're also engaged at the international fora. But tell me about um, what civil society uh, led organizations that are led by women, what are they doing and how are they engaging uh, in, this, in, this, in this issue? Yes, well, I can definitely speak to what my organization's doing. And I forgot that I had a slide oh, yeah, she has <laughs> on this. Slide. So I'm just gonna come over here and get my clicker. Actually, maybe this is a good one just to go back to quickly. Um, there are two international instruments uh, on disarmament and arms control that are really sort of groundbreaking in this space because they recognize a lot of the concepts that we've been talking about so far tonight. Um, the first is the 2013 Arms Trade Treaty uh, the arms trade treaty is meant to regulate transfers, between, uh, transfers of arms between governments. It requires a state's party to, before it, it transfers arms, to make a risk assessment and assess across different human rights and humanitarian criteria if those arms will be used to commit or facilitate those things. And gender-based violence is one of them. And then in 2017, we had the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, which in itself was groundbreaking and transformative uh, because it for the first time brought a human face to nuclear disarmament issues. A lot of the nuclear arms control agreements negotiated in the Cold War were really just about numbers and stockpiles. There was zero recognition of the catastrophic humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons. Um, this treaty recognizes the, the ionizing radiation impact on women that I talked about earlier 
Um, and it also encourages women's participation in disarmament fora. And this does link to your question, I'm sorry. That's okay, you're good there. Um, no, because in both of these, it was really civil society that was instrumental in bringing these concepts forward and pushing them forward. Um, I'm just thinking, where is... All right. Um, and this is, yeah, so different ways in which we're doing it. Like, I, c I can speak for WILPS and what we've been doing, um, especially in our disarmament program. So, for example, before the negotiations of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, we organized a women's march to ban the bomb. Um, and it was the, the sort of, like, flagship event, I guess you could call it, was in New York. We had well over 1,000 people come out in pouring rain to march from Bryant Park across town over to the UN, where there was a handover of a petition from an atomic bomb survivor, the atomic bombs in, in Japan in 1945, to the woman who chaired the treaty negotiation conference. It was a female ambassador. And these, this was complemented by civil society events all around the world on the same day. And the voice and the message of this is a women's march to ban the bomb was very strong. So this is a good, I think, example of civil society-led initiatives to raise awareness on this. Of course, you have to complement it with strong research and strong information. The rhetoric alone is not enough. You need the facts. Um, and then the third photo that I put there comes from our campaign, um, our campaign partners in Cameroon and their work on the campaign to stop killer robots. And I think this probably would get, really get to the crux of what you're asking is that it really has to be the voices of those affected by the weapons in the room at the policy conversations because otherwise we just, we think we know what those experiences are, but we really don't unless we live them. And I'd also like to hear that research matters. So the grad students out there hopefully <laughs> are thinking, yes, this is important. Don't give up. <laughs> Don't give up. Keep doing what you're doing. That's excellent. And enroll in one of the Ball Silly School programs. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just a little plug there. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm also interested in this sort of longer term type of thing as well. This is another thing that I've been thinking about. I mean, often we are talking about, um, you know, we have these uh, moments of crisis and you, you hear dialogue and you hear about an issue. Um, how do we keep these things on the radar? Um, how do we keep... Um, uh, keep this uh, momentum going mm -hmm. that we've gotten in this sort of space we've gotten, the space for dialogue uh, in certain contexts, uh, in the sort of Me Too movement and the attention being paid to gender, mm -hmm. how do we really just keep this, keep this momentum going and make sure that gender um, doesn't fall off the radar um, in, the next, in the next crisis? Um, well, I wish I knew now. Um, I, think, I think it has to, it has to consistently be a priority, but that prioritization has to be reflected in actual policies and practices of governments, of individuals. Um, it's, it's easy for it to be a passing fad. I'm seeing that it's a fad right now in disarmament. Everybody is giving out money and resources and is interested in gender. Um, but three years ago, it wasn't like that. Three years from now, I'm not sure it will be unless we really set some rules in place and some policies in place that make sure it stays there. And resourcing, financial resourcing, is, is the biggest obstacle of all. Um, you saw in the, vi in the video that the cost, I think, of the entire feminist peace movement is like a very small fraction of what one fighter jet costs. And that, that fact speaks volumes about priorities on spending and, and what really matters. Yeah, and, and very, very little of the UN budget goes not just to, to projects and initiatives around uh, gender and women and girls, but also just to organizations that mm -hmm. might be doing work on the ground uh, or organizations that are uh, led uh, by women. Um, and so those larger structural things need to be tackled as mm -hmm. well, you know, going forward. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about was the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a migration scholar. It's what I do. I'm always thinking about migration. So I've, I've managed to work displacement in a few times. But I'm really, <laughs> I do think it's, it's all, these are things are linked together. And uh, in the UN processes I've been part of over the last year, um, I feel like they're, they're still really siloed, right, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. terms of addressing these issues. So we've got sort of conflict over here migration over here, refugees over here, and SDGs and the 2030 agenda and what we're doing around development over here. How can we these be, how can we create dialogue and, and actually move forward um, towards having some sort of collective uh, response or collective engagement? Um, how do we bridge those silos? Yeah, 
it, it's hard, like it really, especially in the UN system, like everything has its own dedicated space and their own dedicated experts. Um, and, and this gen gender is a good t example of this. Um, so there's a whole other area of work, women, peace, and security. It's underpinned by several UN Security Council resolutions that build on earlier international agreements. Um, and they have certain provisions and certain core principles that actually align very much with a lot of what we're trying to do in the disarmament space in bringing greater awareness and gender analysis into our arms control and disarmament policies. But it's like the, the two never actually ever seem to come together. Um, and actually, the, so the, one of the things that I have found the Canadian government is doing a lot lately in the UN space is trying to bridge those gaps and bring better gender awareness into their arms work. And the mission in New York last year, they hosted, um, they hosted a joint meeting of women, peace and security experts and the disarmament experts. Because within the different country missions, you often have, especially for larger countries, different people working on those files separately. And they don't really get together and talk too much. So we had this very interesting meeting where it was like two worlds colliding and you can really see that you need more of that integration and interaction, I think, to have holistic solutions. Yeah. All right, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we turn it over to the audience to hear from you? Um, to, you can ask some questions of Allison. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think maybe something that sort of I was thinking about while the video was playing anyway is that I, I haven't come here to male bash <laughs> or to hate on men. Um, I know a lot of men who are very sensitive and very aware of these things. Um, but the structures that sort of lead to the types of problems that we've been talking about, they are patriarchal. Um, so I want to sort of recognize that I'm not trying to give a, a blanket diss to all the men in the room, um, but that is really important that we, we recognize that where these structures and where these power dynamics come from and what their, their impacts are. All right, thank you. Okay, everyone. So, uh, if you're interested in, in having and in, in, uh, asking a question, um, then we have microphones at either side, here and here. Um, so you're welcome to come down and, and ask a question. Um, and uh, we ask, if possible, formulate it as a question uh, so that we can have a bit of a dialogue. Um, <laughs> and uh, I know the space is very formal, so if you've not been here before, don't be intimidated. Just come down and, and speak at a stand-up microphone. It's better than wearing this weird headset thing. So <laughs> uh, please okay, go on ahead. Um, I can understand throughout the, the world where women's voices are much more repressed or oppressed. Um, but I'm wondering, why do you think that we hear from so many women in the Me Too movement, which I strongly agree with, but we hear nothing as loud from the women, especially in the United States, when it comes to banning the weapons or protecting their children the way they want to protect other women. Women as a group are extremely strong and the relationship to each other is very profound. Mothers, daughters, girlfriends. But I don't hear, I understand boys and their toys, men and their guns. It, it's down there especially, it's been for 400 years. But why don't they have a stronger voice like they do in the women's movement towards weapons to protect their children? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I, I think it is sort of a, a country specific question. Um, most, mo well, yeah. I, think, I don't think that there is that a lot of women's groups aren't interested in or don't have feelings about these issues um, in the United States. Um, one of the strongest anti-gun activist groups, it, it's a coalition of mothers who started because they lost their sons to gun violence uh, in different parts of America. So there are groups that organize around these issues. Um, and I think in, in other places, it's just structurally harder for women to mobilize and to have a voice. Um, but I also, I don't, this is just sort of my own personal opinion. I, f I find that like these disarmament issues, like it's all I've ever worked in in my career, so I know them well. But I also know that when I talk about them to people who don't work in this space, like people's eyes easily glaze over. And I don't, I don't know if it just sounds like maybe too intimidating 
or too technical of a problem to want to try to solve. And maybe that's why people aren't drawn to it. But like you, you make a great point, like as, as mothers, like you want to protect your children from weapons and from war and from hurt. Exactly. Any others? Oh. Hello. Uh, my name is Allison as well. I'm a student here at the Bolsoli School. So I have a kind of specific question regarding the statistic you stated in your presentation, mm -hmm. and that was also brought up in the film. And feel free to correct me if I've written it down incorrectly. But it was uh, the chance of peace agreement lasting 15 years increases by 35% when women are involved in the process of making that agreement. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could speak to the study behind that statistic and maybe referencing some of the countries and or case studies that were examined in coming to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, I was not involved in, in that research, but it is something that our organization was a part of. Um, and it's sort of, I mean, it might be one of those things where it's easier to just email you the details later. Um, but it sort of came out of the context of uh, two years ago, we sort of had this, um, there's this annual meeting in the UN called the Commission on the Status of Women. It's, it's starting now, actually. Next week. Next week, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's sort of like the go-to event for all uh, women-led civil society who come to the UN. And two years ago, when the travel ban was happening in the United States, and women from a lot of conflict-affected countries couldn't actually enter and, and come in to attend it, um, WILP organized sort of like an alternate forum in Geneva, Switzerland, where we have our headquarters, um, that these women could get to. And I think that that study and that statistics really came out of that. And, and the reason and the rationale behind it was the sense of we need to reclaim the UN and we need to reclaim this space. And so understanding our contributions to it are gonna help with that. Um, but if, if you wanted, I could give you my information later and send more details. Give me, we can't see very well, so. We've got one here. Oh, great. <laughs> I was just going to ask, um, I'm finding right now that, demo sorry, I'm gonna step back a bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm finding right now that um, democracy seems to be a bit threatened in many countries right now um, with the way things are changing. I think democratically, I think we're all a little concerned about that um, in various countries. And I'm just kind of wondering how to bridge that gap, like you were saying, between countries that are, you know, kind of embracing a little bit more of this feminist um, movement, like Sweden and Canada, and also countries that are very patriarchal or more, um, um, more in a, like more in, um, you know, more in a, a very different government base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from democracy. So um, how do you bridge that? Like, how do how do women bridge that gap? I wish I knew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'd have a different world. Um, well, I, th I think one thing that is very important is information exchange between women in different country contexts, um, and and for lots of different reasons, to give solidarity and support to one another, but also to sort of understand their different circumstances, to share experiences. Um, you know, maybe maybe someone over here has had this experience in a very undemocratic place, and they can sort of share that with someone else. Of course, in very undemocratic places, information exchange itself um, can be very challenging. Um, I had another point, but now I've forgotten it. Maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs> well, I'll jump in then yes, and just yeah. say that part of it is, I think, about building solidarity to come back to the video, right? Mm -hmm. And to do so in a transnational way, right? Which is uh, a, in part of what Alison is saying, is, is bringing together civil society organizations and, and even individuals, not full organizations, that are from all around the world together. Um, and, and we've seen the results of this uh, in other areas actually um, uh, glean benefits at international fora. I mean, we have the International Convention on the Rights of Domestic Workers, right? We have uh, a new convention on violence um, that's, uh, um, that maybe you could talk about if you wanted to talk about it, um, uh, uh, coming, coming out shortly. Then that's because of individuals and, and organizing together around the world um, to be able to put pressure on those states that are, that are, not, um, that are not actually um, acting in ways that we want them to act or to try to, to push to continue to protect democracy. Um, and so I think, I think that's where the power mm -hmm. lies, um, really. Can I ask another quick question? Yes. Is globalization helping this process or hindering it? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, no, what I think I remember now what I wanted to say before. I think, um, okay, the United States, of course, is a democracy, but it's going through an interesting time um, where decisions are being made often in undemocratic ways. Um, and, and the women's movement there, I feel like, hasn't been this strong in a very, very long time. And it's not just the women's march, you know, the annual big march that we do in different cities, but it's also encouraging more women to run for office, mm -hmm. um, which will then have run on effects that we don't even know about yet. So I think. I think sometimes maybe it's these more desperate situations where, where you are mobilized and encouraged to take action. Of course, in the US, you're free to do this, and it's easier than other countries. Um, but yeah, it's just been an observation of mine. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent uh, and important presentation. I have a question and a comment. I'm wondering if you can assess Canada's uh, role in disarmament at the UN and other international fora. And my comment is, um, you know, Canada has refused to join the UN nuclear ban treaty. And the Prime Minister refused to meet with Satsuko Thurlow, the Canadian woman who co-accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for the ICANN campaign that brought about this treaty. Um, and the week that Canada announced its feminist international aid policy is the same week that the federal government announced our new defense policy. And under that defense policy, we're going to be buying 88 fighter jets, and we're going to be massively increasing military spending to maintain high-level war fighting. Um, so uh, Canada has a problem with patriarchy and in maintaining this uh, weapon and war system. And then uh, just to say that I'm a WILF member, I encourage women to join and support WILF, and I also want to applaud your colleague, uh, Ray Atchison, in her excellent uh, TED talk that she did, which is mm -hmm. just posted on YouTube, called Banning the Bomb, Disarming the, the Patriarchy, and I encourage people to have a look at that video. So thank you very much for the really <laughs> critical work that WILF is doing to try to bring peace in the world. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Oh boy, Canada in disarmament. Where's Project Plowshares? I'm sure you yeah, have some ideas sure. on this. Um, yeah, I mean, like, it depends how much detail you want, but I think, you know, a long time, not a long time ago, years ago, Canada had a really stellar reputation on disarmament. It was the leader uh, in the negotiations that led to the Mine Ban Treaty. Um, it was sort of seen as, as a leader in this area and in this field. And over time and under certain governments and with certain decisions, that deteriorated quite a lot. And then we sort of saw the entrenchment of more conservative policies towards disarmament and towards arms control. In the last two or three years, um, and I'm speaking really just from like what I see in the UN system, I, it might be very different for a domestic audience here, um, I feel like there's been a strong effort to sort of re-embrace like the old Canada. Like I've actually heard diplomats say, hey, Canada's back and we're doing good things in the world again. Um, and I, I really do feel like the intention is there, but if you look at the policies and the examples that you just gave, like you've got the rhetoric over here and then you've got the new spending and the new, the new policies and plans over there, and they're just not compatible. Um, and the reason why I mention Project Plowshares is because I think they do a really great job at consistently pointing out this sort of double speak on the part of the government and bringing it into the mainstream and to people's attention. Because if you don't know about it, you think everything's great and everything's rosy and, you know, yeah. And they're also doing a lot of catch up, right? I mean, if they, as they try to, they end up starting with their rhetoric and then mm -hmm. the action tends to follow or it doesn't if we don't hold them to account. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. I can't see anybody else. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Annalisa. I'm a student here at Ball Silly School. I have a question. When you ask about what people thought about your title, somebody mentioned uh, women and child soldiers. And I was wondering, um, what do you think that women soldiers has to say about empowerment for women? And also, um, do you think that it complicates gender roles? So sorry, say that again. So, so for women soldiers, what do you think it has to say about empowerment for women? And do you think it complicates gender roles? Um, I think, 
I mean, I think women are not monolithic, and I think to pretend that every woman is a peacemaker or doesn't want to fight uh, would, would be incorrect. There are female combatants, and maybe they have gone into, into the military for personal reasons, maybe they've been pressured into it, maybe it's been a situation of forced recruitment um, in, the con in the context of a conflict. Um, the point that I was trying to make earlier is that after that ends, like, their return to civilian life, if they have a return to civilian life, it's going to be a very different journey. Um, and often because of the sort of, you know, gendered and cultural expectations around women having done those things or made those choices. Um, and this is in playing out right now, interestingly, a lot in, in Colombia, since their peace agreement, um, there were women fighters, and now they're kind of, you know, trying to be brought back to a normal life, but there's like hesitation on the part of communities to embrace them in the way that they may have once been. Um, so it's a very complex situation. Yeah, and I think also there's, you know, something to be said about thinking about women's role broadly in the military, in peacekeeping, um, and being involved in, in that as well. You know, I think that that's the other side of this as well, to think about um, the fact that uh, there needs to be more attention made, because I think if there are women involved in peacekeeping and involved in the military, then maybe the institution can do some changing in terms of its thinking about its trajectories and its goals and, and its methods, hmm. right? Interesting. Okay. Are there any others out there? I feel like I'm on a ship. <laughs> I know. It's hard to see. <laughs> oh. Um. Okay. All right. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to share with us? A reflection about um, maybe a way forward, some comments about what your organization is doing in the next um, few years, I think um, that would be really great to share with people. Yeah, um, well maybe I'll just give a bit of background on the organization as a, as a context to what we're doing going forward. Um, WILF is a super interesting organization. It's 103 years old, which makes it the world's oldest women's peace organization. It was founded in 1915 when European women came together to protest the outbreak of World War I. And it has continued over that time as a movement, um, as much as it's been an organization. And I think that right now, WILF is sort of in um, a stronger place as an institution. We're also still a movement. So we have an international secretariat staff of about 20 to 25 people, based mainly in Geneva and New York. We also have, I think now, 38 national sections. Um, and some of them have, you know, they're registered as an NGO in their country. They have offices, like they're really up and running. Others are a bit more nascent, they're a bit more of an association. Uh, we also have groups in lots of places. So it's, it's interesting because I think we really do good at sort of bridging the local and to the international and back and forth again. Um, we're active in a lot of different program areas. So I, I work in the disarmament program with, with Ray, whom you heard about earlier. And yes, you should definitely check out her TED talk. Ray is brilliant and she really nails it uh, in this chat. Um, but we also have a human rights program uh, focused in Geneva. We also have a crisis response program. We have a women, peace and security program. We have consultants working in Ukraine and Bosnia on issues there involving women's participation in peace processes and conflict in those countries. Um, I think what's been interesting is that we take a very harmonized approach uh, to a lot of our work. So, for example, a lot of the work around international arms transfers is really rooted in a human rights perspective. And within WILF, like our disarmament program collaborates a lot with our human rights program on joint submissions to different human rights bodies so that we're not just bringing up these things. Maybe this is a bit to the breaking down the silos. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just trying to talk about arms issues in arms spaces, but go to the human rights spaces and say, hey, you should be concerned about this too because this impacts human rights around the world. So we have, I think, a quite a good uh, cross-departmental <laughs> way of working that I like a lot. Well, that's um, really, really fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing so much of uh, your work and what the organization is doing. Um, for us, it's been, um, for me anyway, personally, it's been a very interesting experience. Thank you. Uh, and what better way to, uh, to mark uh, International Women's Day uh, <laughs> a bit ahead of <laughs> and, and get, us, the get us started on the cusp <laughs> of it uh, than for us to, to have this great dialogue. And thanks uh, also to everyone in the audience. So um, uh, 
I think now we'll, uh, we'll have Alistair's going to come on up and uh, close things up for us. Nothing, uh, nothing says International Women's Day better than an old white guy coming up to talk. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> oh, sorry. At but, least um, you've, you've been bookending us. Anyway, that said, um, <laughs> before we close, uh, We'd like to draw your attention uh, to uh, some upcoming events here at the CG campus over the next few weeks. Uh, first, as part of the cinema series in partnership with the Grand River Film Festival and the museum, CG will be screening a double feature of the documentary shorts Menstrual Man and Period End of Sentence on March the 28th. On April the 2nd, there are still a few seats remaining for the rescheduled uh, oh, sorry, April 2nd, there are still a few seats for the remaining, for the rescheduled date for Empty Planet, featuring Daryl Bricker and John Ibbotson. If you weren't able to register for this event the first time around, now is a great opportunity, and you're here so you know how to find stuff on the CG website. But you can find it on uh, cgonline.org, or you can also find some of these events listed through the Bolsilli School at bolsillischool.ca. Uh, Alison and uh, Jenna. Alison, thank you for traveling up here. Uh, I know we partly bribed you by having your family around. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for taking the time uh, from, a real I know, a really busy schedule in your work and in your life generally. So thank you thank for you coming for up here me. for this. And Jenna, thank you. Uh, Jenna's as tired as I am. Uh, <laughs> and I just more. came from, you know, the building. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you very much for, for serving as, as the, the host and the discussant. Um, and uh, thank all of you for uh, coming into a warm and comfortable space and staying awake. Um, <laughs> and we hope to see you at the next event. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.